Muchas gracias, Jenny. Y Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you also to the all the other participants. Greetings to all of you. For me, it is a great pleasure to be with all of you in this space. And well, we are going to begin talking about this. And I know that the time is ticking and it goes very fast. So I will like to talk about our project, about energy systems, about sovereignty and gender, which was the result of our book, Bottom Up Impulses for Just Transitions, Gender, Territory and Sovereignty. And this project on a methodological level was developed on a virtual basis with more than 80 women, Afro, Indigenous and peasant communities from the departments of La Guajira, Cesar and Boyacá in Colombia. And we had three cross-cutting thematic axes. Those axes, okay, I'm being told that I am speaking too fast, so I will try to speak a bit slower. So there were three cross-cutting thematic axes. Those were found in our research and those axes were gender, territory and community sovereignty. And these three communities share these thematic axes they are close to these spaces where coal is exploited and extracted and therefore they are in a very interesting context in the framework of a just energy transition because as we will see later on they are exposed to different impacts and repercussions coming from the mining coal and therefore within this book we can find a series of recommendations following three main types of transition, which we defined along the process. We can find the mining extractive transition, also energy democratization and the broad and just transition. And now I would also like to tell you a bit more about the coal in Colombia. Here you can see two different types of coal mining on a large scale and small and mid scale. For example, you can see the first picture, which is the small and mid term, mid scale, or the large scale mining regions. Both are included in our book, but today we will talk about the large scale mining regions because this is similar to the Appalachian region in the USA, and it is the kind of mining that can be found in Germany. The graphics that you can see on your left is based on the coal production according to the National Agency for Mining. And as you can see in the three last years, there has been a decline in the coal production. However, the departments from Cesar, Guajira and Guayaca are the biggest producers of coal. And also in terms of export, they are the biggest experts in 2021. For example, there was a total of 48 million tons of coal from Colombia. This export was done to countries such as Portugal, Turkey, Netherlands, United Kingdom, among other countries. And now if we put the focus on the energy system in Colombia, we can see that 17% of the final energy consumed in the country is produced in Colombia. And here we can find the hydroelectrical energy, which is related to 70 and 80% of energy generation. And this greatly depends on the hydrological and environmental conditions. However, 30% is related to thermal sources, such as, for example, liquid fuels, coal and natural gas. In Colombia, we do have other non-conventional sources of energy, but they are more limited. They don't have a big contribution. Thank you very much, Jenny and Lorena. And now I will talk about the impact of the coal on women. So now we will talk about the gender impact. First of all, we need to understand that women are not just simply victims of coal. They are rather agents. And therefore we need to understand and see the different dynamics, 
how mining can generate certain oppressions on women and how women begin with their resistance. So we need to understand that for every creation, there is an oppression and for every oppression, there is a resistance. It is a bottom up impulse coming from mainly women. And now you will see a very simple graphic. Here, I just would like to show you the complexities of this gender impact that women are facing in our coal regions. Of course, this is not a comprehensive image. I just would like to give you a look on how we can start joining forces and joining these two different topics of oppression and resistance. On the bottom left, you will see the mining operation and there are some environmental repercussions on the territory, on the hardcore sources, for example, the deviation of rivers, soil degradation, air pollution, and among other effects, we can see the reduction of the agricultural activity in these territories. And this is an ancestral activity, which is fundamental for the local economy of these territories. And related to this, we can see a series of investment projects from the state and from multinational agencies that are going to destroy those local economy schemes and their own existence. Now, we can also see the patriarchal norms because there is the major society in Colombia, and together with this lack of job alternatives, this leads to limitations on women specifically. And this has lots of consequences, for example, increase in exploitation and child sexual exploitation, and also the isolation of women in the domestic sphere, which is the consequence, well, and an unequal distribution of work. So this is also interrelated with an increase in gender-based violence, as we saw previously on many other occasions. And now, on the one hand, if we take a look and coming back to the environmental issues, we also know that those have very serious consequences on health. And this can lead to cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, which especially affect children under the age of five years old. So those are conditions that could seem to limit this paralysis and this action. But however, this is mobilizing women. For example, many women in La Guajira, where we mainly work, were telling us that they began with the struggle after their children began suffering from different diseases from mining for example they had cardiovascular respiratory diseases and this issue was with what led them to defend their own territory because they wanted to defend the experiences of their children and the diseases they were suffering from at the same time we know that this isolation in the domestic sphere helped them not to see that that big exposure to western cultural values for example, this did happen to men because they were working in the industrial sector. For example, they had to learn Spanish and they had to adopt or to translate this nature experience as something which is commercialized, something that is related to an economic value. And women, on the other hand, they were outside these dynamics and they see themselves as the real guardians of their own territory, thanks to their ancestral knowledge, because they were able to rest in this territory and they have these big links to the territory and this ancestral knowledge. So on the one hand, this goes beyond because this also has repercussions. This goes to an increase in targeted killings women are suffering from these targeted killings, especially in coal regions. And this is linked to the gender-based violence that we saw previously. We also see the impact of mining and the national authorities to exclude women in decision-making processes under the logic that men are easier to negotiate because a man can have this economic value and not women. So again, due to this exposure that they had in their work. And despite 
all these factors because these maybe could lead to a strengthening of money, but we have to understand that these resistance actions are generating alternatives because they are creating new worlds in such different ways that we will see now. And here we have to understand that extractivism and coal mining are not isolated phenomena. So we need to take both into account because they are related to other symptoms, other systems on a global level, which are part of the same conglomerate in terms of ideas, for example, extractivism or things such as the climate change, the model of nation state, the commercialization of nature. So seeing nature as a resource, also racism and colonialism, gender-based violence, the monopoly of the big pharmaceuticals, the monopoly of the big banks. So the actions being led by women, we see them as a resistance towards this model and resistance against this extractivist model. This is the case, for example, of direct and non-violent actions, such as, for example, community projects with renewable energies. We also see the creation of own government mechanisms, open discussions, community gardens, the exercise of strengthening of their own mechanisms, empowerment of the gender, poetry, urban art, and also mechanisms, community mechanisms, for example, for community savings banks or solidarity economy, different ecosystems, pedagogical exercises on the worldview, for example, the ancestral jobs in this case of these women, and in general terms, every action that will promote this strengthening of women in their own communities and with the territory. So we need to see all these, we need to take them into account against action, against this mining. So we can see a big diversity of women because this is what they are understanding by resistance. So they are not only making this resistance against mining, they are also dreaming, thinking of this new world that we need in order to survive as a species. So women are already creating this new world in the territories under different ways. So we need to understand this when we talk about the role of women. And now very briefly, just to give you an idea about the energy transition in Colombia. This is understood as mega projects, for example, we can see that on the left in Hidritango, Antioquia, the uh, sound parks in Cesar, or for example, the wind parks in La Guajira. And just by seeing these pictures, it is easily comparable with Cerrejón in the bottom, and we can see some similar things, for example, the appropriation of big land the exclusion of local communities, the lack of control, the lack of governance. So we have to ask ourselves who is benefiting from these mega projects. So we need to ask ourselves these things and to see whether we are looking for that transition. And now I would like to close my intervention with these questions. So can we keep talking about just energy transitions from our current system, the anthropocentric, androcentric, state-centric, neoliberal capitalist and grand capitalist system, or does this discussion demand a fundamental rethinking of our life in society and community based on the respect for the other, for the earth and for life itself? Well, these are my questions and now I will give the floor to Lorena again. Thank you very much, Oscar. And as I said in the beginning, based on the experience with the communities in this project, we could find different impulses and recommendations which are structured around recommendations and three different types of energy transition. First of all, the mining extractive transition. First and foremost, we need to think about the end of the coal economy on a global level and the demands for clean energy. It is important to think of the closure of mines in Colombia 
And by this, I mean, for example, thinking about the design, implementation, and adoption of how this mind closure should work. We also need to see how this could be possible. This needs to be a planned project and something that needs to be discussed with the local communities and with the general citizens, especially with the participation of local women. This is fundamental for every making, for every decision making processes. We need to recognize the responsibilities. Also, job alternatives need to be created for those people who are currently working in the mining industry. For example, entrepreneurship, new sustainable industries. And we need to find a space to strengthen the ancestral practices about subsistence. This was fragmented in the communities. And precisely with this, we thought of different recommendations that I would like to explain now. The first recommendation would be to strengthen the critical voices from the territories so that there are guarantees for the community leaders, both men and women, so that they can be leaders and without having to experience fear to violence so that they can live in decent conditions. This is essential. They need to have dialogue spaces and also incidence spaces for national and international level. But as I say, with guarantees, and actually according to the Institute for Studies for Development and Peace, currently there are 35 social leaders that have been killed in Colombia. And this is just in March. And this very same institute published recently the graphic that you can see in this picture. They published this in Twitter and Colombia is the Latin American country with the biggest number of killings of human rights defenders in 2021. And without any doubt, this is a key fact in the call mining translation. Of course, there are some other recommendations in this translation, such as, for example, the public recognition of the damage caused by coal extraction. Also, the creation and strengthening of job alternatives. And of course, you can take a further look. And because of time restraints, I will continue now with the other energy transition type, which is the energy democratization. Previously, we were talking about finding a purpose of the coal extraction and the power generation through fossil fuels. But within this second point, the energy democratization, we need to rethink of property and consumption and also the decisions in terms of energy. Here, I would like to say that in terms of consumption, we need to have an affordable and quality electricity service. And secondly, communities must have control over the forms of energy generation that supply them. Here, we can also find some recommendations, but I will now go into the other type of energy transition, which is a broad and just transition. Exactly. So as I said, it is clear that we need processes, dialogue processes, and very deep changes that will have a far reaching impact so that we can have these transitions, the mining extractivism transition. And the second one are just some of the small steps that we have to take. Here we can see what we can relate to a broad and just transition because energy transitions are not a historical moment with a precise beginning and end. They are not only the moment of economic and environmental restructuring of coal dependence. However, we can relate them to, for example, transformation of ongoing processes. So all these practices that we want to adopt in our daily lives as communities, as a society. 
So these translation processes, apart from a technological change, they also include a big joint process with different methods, with different approaches that complement themselves, such as, for example, the gender focus, the community sovereignty, and the rootedness to the territory and what this means. And that's all from me, because I know that I already exceeded my time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Oscar, and thank you so much, Lorena, for this very, very enriching and excellent presentation. I also really like your drawings. I think that your presentation showed us, among a lot of other things, that the switch from fossil fuels to renewable energies alone won't be sufficient to make the energy production just. A just and inclusive energy transition must in each case respect and enable community sovereignty, community sovereignty and enable energy democracy. Thank you so much. Um, I know that there's one question in our Q&A section. However, since we are a bit behind um, our timetable, I want to postpone that question to our final discussion at the end of the webinar, but we won't forget it. Thank you for the question. And now we will virtually travel from Colombia to the, to the Appalachians and welcome our next speaker, which is Gabe Schwartzman. Hello, Gabe. Um, Gabe is a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. He studies questions of gender and race in the economic transition of the Appalachian co-regions. And yeah, Gabe, over to you. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you everybody for being here and thank you to uh, the folks at the Wuppertal Institute for organizing this webinar. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so yes, as, as Jenny just said, I'm a human geographer at the University of Minnesota. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the politics of masculinity and the end of the coal industry in the Appalachian Mountains in the United States. Um, and, and I'm talking about political barriers to just transition politics to ju just transition policies in the United States. Um, as, so as you see in this map, when I discuss the Appalachian region, um, I'm talking about the coal fields in the mountains in the Eastern part of the US, there in the, in the red box. And the Appalachian coal fields are some of the most impoverished places in the United States, as you see in the second map. Um, so as opposed to some parts of the world, Appalachian coal has seen a decline in market share due to competition from natural gas and other more competitive, cheaper coal markets in the US and, and not, a not a political process uh, or not a political pressure to decarbonize. Um, despite this, coal's decline has provoked highly political response and has become enrolled in national politics. Um, coal mining's decline is politically significant because of the gendered politics of coal. And um, today I'm going to explain to you how or, or, or talk a little bit about that. So um, an important starting point is that the coal economy in the Appalachian region has been in decline for almost 50 years. Uh, and although employment has collapsed most sharply in the last 10 years, um, you know, 80% of miners have lost their jobs essentially in the last 10 years. Uh, so it's been in decline for a lot longer than that, but that this is really the, the end of a moment. Um, second, coal mining has been a gendered segregated industry since, since the 80s, 1980s, when affirmative action policies were abolished. Um, during the 1970s, mines had been legally mandated to integrate their workforces. Um, on a gender level, but after that point, um, women have essentially been barred from employment uh, due to discrimination. And it's also important, important to note that um, black miners, African Americans used to comp comp compromise 25% of the industry as well. But from the 50s and 60s, those jobs were mechanized out. Um, you know, they were dangerous and dirty jobs that were given to racialized black workers um, who were made redundant. And that makes today Appalachian coal miners 98% white. 
Um, and um, because of the gains of organized labor in Appalachia and across the um, United States, hold on, sorry, oh, there we go. Um, mining has been a well-paid job with very good benefits. As feminist economic geographer Linda McDowell and political theorist Melinda Cooper discussed, these were Fordist family wages and still are. That is enough money to, that a masculinized factory worker or miner could support a heteronormative family. This meant that miners in Appalachia often make today upwards of eighty to ninety thousand dollars per year. What what is that? Um, Fit seventy thousand euro, um, a very high salary for rural and impoverished regions. Um, and not only is mining a well-paid profession, it's it's um, it has been shrouded and tied up in discourses about masculinity. Uh, scholars note that miners are symbolically represented as hypermasculine. Um, they're represented as tough guys working in dangerous conditions, um, taking sacrifices for the nation and providing energy for America. Um, additionally, across Appalachia, there's an idea that mining is real men's work, whereas jobs in the public or service sectors are not. So the, these tropes have taken on a new political significance in the last 20 to 30 years in the context of what Linda McDowell calls the feminization of labor, which is getting back to partly um, Paula and Marius's point. Um, McDowell wrote 30 years ago, all work is becoming women's work, whatever the gender, which I think is, is, is interesting in this context, you know, from mechanization, declining real wages and offshoring of manufacturing jobs in the United States, um, but also because of the very real gains of a feminist social movement, um, women have entered the workforce in droves in recent decades. And so as Melinda Cooper argues, in part because of women entering the workforce and gaining new political rights, the economy of the global north has become more service sector and it has left workers uh, in precarious positions. So in Appalachia, in the last 30 years, as women and men both become increasingly, both work in increasingly feminized jobs, there has regionally become staggering depopulation. People have left in large numbers. Um, without good paying jobs, people leave the community. And, and in particular, there's good data to show that as young women grow up, um, they have disproportionately moved out of the re region in recent decades. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about that more later. Um, in, in the context of feminization of labor, many people, and not just men, I want to make that clear, have become increasingly nostalgic for a time when lots of men were receiving high paying jobs in the mines. People in Appalachia have become both resentful about the loss of jobs and uh, resentful about the about loss of culturally valuable jobs, right? Um, a neoliberal social movement from the 1980s forward latched on to this resentment. Um, neoliberal and conservative right politicians have consistently promised to restore uh, a conservative gender order with men as breadwinners, um, while, while simultaneously dismantling Fordism and the jobs that provided uh, you know, good working conditions for people. So in Appalachian, this conservative right movement has successfully waged a campaign to stop environmental regulation and also to stall any planning for a post-coal transition. Um, these pro-coal mobilizations have relied on Christian right politics, drawing on the idea that an attack on coal is an attack on both prosperity, but also a heteronormative gendered order, right? It's, these politics have been so successful because people have witnessed real declines in quality of life and the decline in coal has meant poverty and despair. Um, and, and so po politicians that promise to restore coal, I think we should understand them as restore, promising, promising to restore the good times and that nostalgia is intimately connected to this gendered economic order. So, you know, in the US when politicians talk about coal, which they do all the time on a national stage, um, they're, they're invoking this, this important symbol of masculinized white working class prosperity. Um, you know, it's almost shorthand for maintaining the gendered order, order of family wages. Um, but what's interesting is that in Appalachia, everybody knows, sorry, um, everybody knows that the coal industry is not coming back 
and the last decade has made that abundantly clear. So there's kind of a contradiction there, right? People are both taken with nostalgic politics, but also know that it can't come back. Um, sorry. Um, one result is that current plans for economic transition in the region that have taken part promise to bring back Fordist family wages. So, and here's a clip from an advertisement of a government funded um, project for uh, economic transition. And you might have to turn it up. Oh, sorry. So um, if you could hear that, essentially, he's an old coal miner who goes back on his strip mine or open surface mine to, um, to, to run, cr run crops instead of coal. Um, so this was a catchy video, but they were unable to deliver on those jobs because uh, functionally, the political economy of the coal fields doesn't support that kind of high paged wage anymore. Like they, that was, I think two people got employed in that project. Many just transition programs promise to restore this gendered economy, but it's a promise they can't keep. And more importantly, that gendered economy did not and does not serve everyone equally. It's, it's actually been a quite unequal um, distribution of benefits. And um, what we need to do, I'm gonna just finish with some recommendations is stop focusing on the men whose jobs were displaced and are being displaced and focus on creating entirely new economies where all the participants can, can live well. Um, we, I think we should take a regional approach that is uh, to look to increase quality of life for all people in a region with investments in things like school, healthcare, community facilities, parks. And um, we should consider what it would look like to have more direct cash assistance for people living in the wake of fossil fuels um, uh, and raise the quality of life and incentive, incentivize people to stay someplace and to move there. So I'll finish there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you for this excellent input. Um, yeah, I learned a lot. And I think your presentation made it very clear that we won't be able to understand the coal transition and especially the massive resistance against coal decline without analyzing gender relations. Um, ah, you also wrote your public publication in the chat. Thank you for that. Um, so far, I do not see any qu direct questions to Gabe in the Q&A. Uh, that's okay, you will. Um, have the possibility to raise questions to Gabe in the discussion later on. Okay, since there are no questions, um, I would go on. Um, for our last presentation, we will cross the Atlantic Ocean and travel to Eastern Germany, more specifically to the Lausitz. The Lausitz is Germany's second biggest lignite area. And from here, I have the pleasure to announce Franziska Stölzel, who will present us how the organization Effie Kraft works for gender just structural change. Franziska is a research associate at the United Nations University with a focal point on social change and regions transformation. Franziska, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. I also have to admit that Gabe said so many things we can usually use for Nazatia as well that I might not have to say so much at the end. But let's say I want to share my screen first. So you should see it now. 
So a very warm welcome also from my side and thank you for the possibility to present our network FB Kraft today. I'm currently sitting in Weisswasser, a small town in Saxony near a big coal mining pit in Germany. My name is Franziska Stölzel and today I am very happy to present our women network FB Kraft, which means something like F, like power, the F presents the female power we want to force in our region, which is also the letter for power in physics. We are a group of women with different backgrounds, but we all want to strengthen and support the visibility and presence of women in Lusatia, in the coal mining process, in the decarbonization process. Um, we live in a rural area in this transition, energy transition and lignite phase out discussion. Um, this transition is a very popular, popular theme in Germany, but um, unfortunately represents a lot of male leaders and also, of course, male workers, as uh, Gabe already said very well or showed us very well. Um, same in Germany, and we are working to change that. So, FB Kraft has a legal responsibility and publisher from the district office of Görlitz, our um, district uh, responsibility. The first project was made by the University of Applied Science, Zittau Görlitz within the research institute from the university from this university the institute for transformation living and social special development so what is the importance of our pro program of our project some facts um, for the beginning the eastern german part of um the Eastern German part, Lusatia, is the part that um, was still GDR 30 years ago and is the one with the most women losses after German reunification in whole Europe. So we are a good and a bad praxis example. And of course, less women also mean less decisions for women. We have a lack of parity, no equality in the discussions on energy transition at all. We want to draw attention for the fact of fewer considerations. We know that women do a lot of unpaid work in addition to normal jobs, so to their normal jobs and vocations, which is not really recognized like the care work women do, the household, gardening, you know, all these examples from own experiences and further we would like to raise awareness that these are above average numbers of men who shape the future of our region due to politics leading positions decision making structures what we need to to strengthen the attractivity for women to be engaged and to shape the region and to attract more women also to come to the region to show the advantages of the region um, which we can only do by a visualization of women and these um, experiences and advantages they, the, the women um, can speak for their own. So we want to support these women who are here, who want to come here. We are working for a strengthened visibility which also allows exchange of experiences. And here you can see some pictures from a magazine made for and by people um, from the region, from Lusatia, which uh, shows only one woman. And I also have an article picture that shows our problem very clear. So, this headline, the red headline says, strong women, strong, strong economy, but we see a man as an interview partner. And this is of course not how it works. So something about our her story in 2015, 16, Julia Gabler, who's also 
in the panel today. Um, warm welcome to you as well. Came to Lusatia, our region. She's a sociologist with a focal point on social change and upheavals from uh, forms of coping, particularly in East Germany. When she came here, she always um, told us, as I was a student of her, that she was wondered and kind of shocked about the opportunities uh, she, she sees for women, especially in important transition processes like the um, phase out of, of lignite. And she wanted to get some numbers on what's happening here. And was the research called Who Comes, Who Goes, Who Stays? A study of young people's remaining as persons in the country and our district of, of Görlitz. And we want, or I want to present some research facts. The core statement of the study were that her, especially um, for young people, career aspirations in the region are often not feasible, more often in technical scientific fields. Study also shows that young people with special commitment and responsibility have stronger desire to stay in the region. So let's keep on moving and uh, force this. For their young women, young people in general who are Lusatian origins have also stronger perspectives to stay. So we have to focus on that as well. And these young people want the same thing, leisure and mobility offers that has to um, be more often in decision planning processes and also the uh, visualization that this has to be expanded. Interesting to know that even 2016, we were talking about attractivity of peripheral rural life through digitalization and infrastructure. Why right now it's more interesting due to the COVID crisis. Um, we know that we don't want to live in cities so often due to pandemics or uh, different um, situations like now. Um, networking, visualization, discourse, exchange, these all are um, require support and um, also to desire the stay in the region have to get an important issue to talk about and to find opportunities how to develop these. For example, the social relationships or role model effects we can we can use for the future. So we can improve this due to accept the mobility of young adults and creating opportunities for them to return. It's necessary to define and shape shrink age and visualize the advantages within these projects, also to protect and strengthen and support women by counteracting discrimination, unequal treatment and um, marginalization. So we have different tasks in our network we want to force or we want to um, work on as you know we are a network we are strongly working to support women in different aspects for example networking so we can um, other women and their tasks ideas and needs show and make these efforts and also experiences visible. We want to contribute parity in decision-making processes, support women who come to Lusatia or who have plans to do so. Important topic and hard to realize, of course, is a task to bring the necessity of equality into these further committees. Therefore, we organize events such as an online regulars table that's um, once a month right now. We try to get uh, together, organize meetings, workshops, and seminars. We create spaces that help women to talk to each other and to recruit more women to talk about their experiences and to the work they do. We found out that the joint work on similar topics increased the empathy for each other and working on different tasks opens the possibility of experiential genes. Of course, the 
exchange and visibility within the group, strengthen self-esteem and self-efficacy so we can create a voice and a structural change process. We know that it's not really um, based on perfection. It just needs to be really, um, you know, meaningful for each other to talk about the the things, the, the thoughts we have. So we also talk a lot about our barriers um, we, we face in the region. You know it from your own experiences mostly. We have a lot of men in leading positions who have little empathy for female needs. And um, we, in addition, the energy, energy sector is a technical job that the phase out mainly affects men. We have 30% less young women in Lusatia, which also means a lot of work is distributed among a few women. There are women strongly affected by marginalization and equality. We are really, really working for being heard. And most important right now is that, of course, we face other issues right now, like the COVID pandemic or the Ukraine war that affects us right now and mostly in uh, a few years, we will talk about stronger um, visibilities of climate change. Um, on this picture, you can see our regional group for funds where only one woman is working in. So which is um, also, something we want to want to force and want to work on to bring more women in the core areas and core um, places. So I want to talk about our future vision at least. We, um, what we need and want is a new all-inclusive study on women in the region. Further, we need recognition of work done by women, additional work, unpaid work, of course. Uh, recognize the hard fact that women in the upper positions are missing in the region and that the region is shaped by this. For example, there are more opportunities for right-wing parties to make gains and gain ground. We are working on supporting projects as uh, women as economic factors, as people who are dependent on infrastructure and public mobility and least, but uh, most important getting women to political and of politics and offices. So here you can see some contact possibilities. Julia Gabler is an innovator of our project. My name is on the last point, and we also have some other women, of course, we can um, talk with my references and thanks for your attention.